For this lecture, we're going to talk about pediatric bone tumors. Uh, and pediatric bone tumors are important to kind of consider differ, uh, separately from other bone tumors in that when we talk about bone tumors, one of the things we use to help us differentiate and to help us hone our differential diagnosis is age. So age is important just like location is important. So uh, certain tumors are common in kids and young adults and certain tumors, for example, such as a multiple myeloma is going to be common in older adults. Uh, we're not going to think of multiple myeloma when we see a tumor in a 7-year-old, just like we're not going to think of EG when we think of a tumor in a 60-year-old. It's just statistically extremely unlikely to happen. So uh, we're going to look at common pediatric bone tumors, uh, and some of this uh, is going to go through tumors we've already been through uh, on some of the other lectures, but uh, in this case pertaining to uh, kids and young adults. So uh, we're going to look at these and based upon the matrix of the lesion or what they're made out of, uh, we'll divide these into osteoid tumors, uh, cartilaginous tumors, fibrous tumors, uh, cystic lesions, round blue cell tumors, uh, and then miscellaneous things that don't fit nicely into any of those categories. So first up, osteoid tumors. Uh, and probably the uh, most important uh, and certainly one of the more common osteotumors in kids and young adults is going to be osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is a nasty tumor. Uh, it's a scary tumor. It's a very aggressive tumor. Um, and it's uh, certainly one of the more common pediatric bone tumors, primary bone tumors uh, of kids and young adults. So uh, osteoid, osteosarcomas are osteoid tumors, so they're going to have osteoid matrix. They're going to look aggressive and nasty, like this one does in the proximal humerus. You can see that this is a geographic lesion, but it has a wide zone of transition. It's sclerotic and has this uh, very aggressive periosteal reaction associated with it. Um, you see something like this in common locations, such as the proximal humerus or about the knee. Those are the favorite locations for osteosarcoma. Something that looks like this in a kid in those locations, you're going to think osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma. Could it be other things? Sure, it's possible but osteosarcoma is going to be far more likely uh, than that, that. You don't need advanced imaging. Advanced imaging is not going to help you make a differential diagnosis or help you say that this is osteosarcoma. You can look at the radiograph and say, hey, this looks bad. This is in the right place in a kid. This is osteosarcoma. They will go to MRI, and the reason they go to MRI is for staging, though. Um, so that's what you go for MRI. You want to look for skip lesions, which can occur within the bone. Um, uh, this is an MRI showing an osteosarcoma in the uh, distal tibia here. Um, you don't see any skip lesion here, but this MRI is not fully appropriate for staging in that you want to image from joint to joint uh, at least. So you, w the skip lesions that occur tend to occur within the same bone. They don't tend to cross or jump across a joint space, though that's possible. Um, or you can have more distant metastasis as well and very advanced disease. Um, so MRI is for staging to look for the extent of the tumor, to look for skip lesions, to look for soft tissue involvement, involvement of neurovascular bundles, things the surgeons would like to know about before they go in to do any resection. Okay, osteosarcoma, common osteoid tumor in kids. Osteoid osteoma uh, is another osteoid tumor which is common in uh, kids and young adults. Um, the classic history you've heard with these is I like a plane of pain at night. It gets better with aspirin or NSAID use. Um, it can be found in long bones. It can be found in the spine. And the posterior elements, as you see uh, one right here, this lytic lesion uh, with this kind of more central sclerosis. In fact, it's really more sclerotic than lytic in this, uh, this example right here. Um, these are benign tumors. There's a couple options for treating these. Uh, one, you can just do nothing and sometimes they go away, symptomatic relief. In the old days, they used to go in and cut them out. These days, usually they get uh, treated with radiofrequency ablation. So small lucent lesions, central nidus, and the posterior elements of the spine. Um, for example, in a teenager who's coming in with back pain and they have the splinting, uh, you may see that. Uh, or in the long bones, usually cortically based. Uh, and can often mimic uh, a Brody's abscess. This is a radiograph which shows another osteoid osteoma, though you wouldn't necessarily know it by looking at it. All you really see is this uh, non-aggressive periosteal reaction, this heaped up cortex right here. Maybe this lucency right here is real, and that's actually the nidus uh, or the central part of the osteoid osteoma. Uh, the nidus would be a sclerotic focus, which you're not going to see on the radiograph, but you would see that on CT. 
Um, you see this, I, I think really you're stuck with a differential with uh, osteoid osteoma or a Brody's abscess. If you don't see this lucency right here, I think you have to include a stress fracture in that differential. Um, Langerhans cell histiocytosis can occasionally look like this, but it's much uh, less common, so that's another thing to consider. But really, you see a radiograph uh, and you see this kind of uh, heaped up uh, solid uh, non-aggressive periosteal reaction. Uh, if you don't see a lucency in the middle, you're stuck with a differential of uh, a Brody's abscess, osteoidosteoma, or a stress fracture. Obviously, if you see, like a, for example, a lytic fracture line across, you can just throw the other ones out and you're done. That's a fracture. Uh, an uncommon osteoid tumor is an osteoblastoma. Um, these are pretty rare. They uh, usually appear as lytic lesions, though they can appear, appear as sclerotic lesions. And they often have some internal matrix associated with them, and they tend to occur in the spine is where you're most likely to see them, though they will occur in long bones as well, too. This is an example of an osteoid osteoma, sorry, an osteoblastoma uh, in the spine uh, right here, which is, again, a common location for them. Uh, when they occur, though, remember, they're pretty rare tumors all in all. All right, moving on to cartilaginous tumors. Um, three main cartilaginous lesions we're going to look at. Uh, osteochondromas, which are not truly tumors uh, in the absolute sense of the word, but uh, certainly we talk about them like they're tumors. Uh, chondroblastomas and uh, enchondromas. Uh, this picture on the right shows us a patient with multiple, multiple hereditary exostosis, multiple osteochondromas. As you can see, there's one coming off the radius here. There's a sessile one off the ulna. Uh, and it's caused this uh, matalung deformity, uh, which is one of the causes of matalung deformity with multiple uh, osteochondromas. Okay, so osteochondromas. Um, osteochondromas are really just kind of bits of the bone that grow abnormally. So the thought is some of the... Um, Degenerative cells kind of start growing where they're not supposed to be growing, and it kind of you get growth or this exostosis of the bone in unusual locations. Most often, these are just a solitary uh, lesion or solitary osteochondroma, um, but there is a condition uh, hereditary multiple exostosis or multiple hereditary exostosis, you may hear it uh, said in either way, in which you have multiple of these lesions. The key uh, descriptor and your key thing that's going to help you make this diagnosis of an osteochondroma is that they're going to be in continuity with the cortex and the marrow. Um, so you see this lesion right here, here's the cortex, and here's the marrow. It's all in nice contigu contiguity, uh, and so you can uh, safely call that an osteochondroma. This patient, again, has multiple of these, uh, and usually these patients with multiple uh, osteochondromas, they're going to occur about the knee. So if you see one and there's any doubt uh, if this patient has uh, multiple of them, really probably you just get the knee x-ray and you can make that diagnosis. Now, you can look for all the other ones scattered throughout their body, but if you see them about the knee like this, you know for sure that they have uh, multiple uh, osteochondromatoses. <clears throat> Next up is the chondroblastoma. This is not a common tumor, but um, it's a good one to keep in mind for uh, differential for a lytic lesion in the epiphysis in a child or a young adult. Uh, these are geographic lytic lesions. Uh, they're going to occur in the epiphysis or in an epiphyseal equivalent, which is an apophysis. So this picture right here uh, shows us this geographic lytic lesion with a narrow zone of transition, non-sclerotic border, which is in the uh, greater trochanter in this case. And this is an apophysis, so an epiphyseal equivalent. So it's okay for us to think about a chondroblastoma being here. Uh, these are benign uh, cartilaginous lesions. Often you won't see any matrix within them. Uh, you'll go to MR. Uh, and they tend to be uh, on MR, usually cartilage is very bright on T2-weighted sequences, but in chondroblastomas they may be actually dark to intermediate on T2-weighted sequences, which can uh, fool you a little bit. And one of the other classic manifestations is that they have a lot of reactive edema around them, as you can see in this case, this is the MR of the same case as before. Um, a lot of reactive edema around them. If they're next to a joint, they may cause a, a joint effusion, a reactive joint effusion. Um, and this one also shows us that this lesion has a fluid fluid level, which if you will remember on our differential diagnosis for fluid fluid levels on MR, chondroblastoma is on that list. Uh, the other things, again, are giant cell tumor, aneurysm or bone cyst, and a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. Just another thing about this uh, case, this is a fracture line here from an insufficiency fracture uh, from this lesion. And this was a chondroblastoma 
in the uh, greater tuberosity, uh, sorry, the greater trochanter, which is an uh, apophysis, uh, so an epiphyseal equivalent. Um, but um, you may see them in any epiphysis or uh, epiphyseal equivalent. Enchondromas are common lesions. Uh, you see lots of enchondromas. They're benign uh, tumors. Um, just want to talk about some of the uh, multiple hereditary, or the, sorry, they're not hereditary actually. Actually, the multiple um, enchondroma syndromes, which are Oliers and Mafuchis. Uh, the picture on the right here is an example from a patient with Oliers syndrome. They have multiple enchondromas, as you can see, all throughout the hand, uh, distal uh, radius and distal ulna. It's very bizarre looking lesions right here, which are enchondromas uh, with this cartilaginous matrix you see within them. You don't really see the matrix so much in the ones in the hand, which is often the case. Um, so Oliers and Mafuchis are the two uh, multiple enchondroma syndromes. Uh, they're not hereditary. They do carry a higher risk of malignant transformation. So a single enchondroma by itself, very unlikely to undergo malignant uh, transformation into a chondrosarcoma. But when you get multiple in these um, multiple enchondroma syndromes, um, then they have to start being monitored and you're going to worry about it a little more because their percentage of malignant transformation is, is much higher than in these single um, enchondromas. This is just another example showing you, uh, in a different patient, showing you what they'll look like in long bones. They look very strange, these enchondromas in long bones, in the multiple enchondromas. Uh, they don't look like the typical enchondroma with a nice uh, chondroid matrix. What you really have is these kind of tubular lucencies, which are tunneling through the bone, and these are just cartilage growing from the growth plate. Notice how they start from the growth plate and then kind of tunnel into the bone on the other side of the bone, too, as well, in the femur. So starting in the growth plate uh, and tunneling into the bone, it's very strange looking tunnel-lytic lesions, and these are typical appearance of multiple enchondromas in uh, a child with a multiple enchondromatosis. That's what, they, uh, that's what they look like in the long bones. They can be very confusing if you haven't seen them before. All right, next up are fibrous lesions. Uh, two lesions we're gonna talk about are fibrous dysplasia and uh, fibrosanthomas or non-ossifying fibromas. Fibrosanthomas or non-ossifying fibromas are very common. They're benign lesions. They're made up of fibrous tissue. Uh, and most of these uh, kind of heal or go away spontaneously within two to three years. Uh, the typical location for and appearance of these are eccentrically located or slightly cortically based. They're going to be geographic 1A lesions. They're going to have a nice sclerotic border, just like this one does right here. Very benign appearing. Over time, as they heal, they'll fill in with a, a denser uh, matrix and it looks sclerotic and you may just see this kind of scar, this sclerotic scar from where one had healed. Um, so very common. You don't need to do anything about these. You don't need any advanced imaging. Occasionally if the bone or the cortex thins out a lot, they'll have a pathological fracture through them and they'll come to attention that way. Usually they're picked up uh, um, incidentally for some other reason when you're looking at them. Uh, and they don't need to get the million dollar workup for something like this. Just leave it alone. It's benign. It'll eventually uh, go away and heal on its own. Alright, we're going to take a quick break uh, and we'll come back with part two of the uh, pediatric uh, bone tumors.